Hello, this is David Wilcoxon, and in the Preterism Decoded Introduction video, I cover the key points that Preterists make to show how the narrative of Revelation being about events in the first century doesn't fit. In this video, I will provide more information about some key points to help you see that the historicist narrative aligns better with scripture and history. I won't give a full verse-by-verse -verse explanation of the historicist narrative as that took 66 videos in the Revelation Timeline Decoded video series. I will provide a summary of the fulfillment so that you can see a different explanation to help you see that the scriptural and historical evidence reveal that the prophecies in Revelation are not about the events in Jerusalem in the first century. Preterists cite Revelation 1-7 to proclaim that it points to the destruction of Jerusalem in 70 AD. It says, Behold, he cometh with clouds, and every eye shall see him, and they also which pierced him. And all kindreds of the earth shall well because of him. Even so, amen. First of all, it says that every eye shall see him. Did every eye on earth see Messiah return? No. The early church fathers did not record this taking place, and human history is still playing out. Did some of the Jewish leaders who saw Messiah pierced on the cross see the incredible signs in the heavens that marked their desolation? Yes. Jewish historian Josephus, who documented the destruction of Jerusalem in the temple, witnessed that besides these signs, a few days after that feast, on the one and twentieth day of the month, a certain prodigious and incredible phenomenon appeared. I suppose the account of it would seem to be a fable were it not related by those that saw it, and were not the events that followed it of so considerable a nature as to deserve such signals. For before sunsetting, chariots and troops of soldiers in their armor were seen running about among the clouds and surrounding of cities. I've seen preterists misrepresent what Josephus declared to say that he said that Messiah returned, but that is not what he described. The medieval Jewish historian Sefer Yasapan expounds upon this angelic army in the sky by saying, Moreover, in those days were seen chariots of fire and horsemen, a great force flying across the sky near to the ground, coming against Jerusalem and all the land of Judah, and all of them horses of fire and riders of fire. So in that description, you don't see any mention of Messiah returning, just a sign in the heavens. The Jews, whose descendants delivered Messiah up to be killed, will see him when he returns in victory, and all will be gathered for judgment, even those who caused him to be crucified and pierced. John Gill, who wrote a whole Bible commentary, says, And they also which pierced him, his hands, feet, and side, when they crucified him, both the Roman soldiers, who actually did it, and the body of the Jewish nation, the rulers and common people who consented to it, and at whose instigation it was done, these, being raised from the dead, shall see him with their bodily eyes, whom they so used. Preterists point to the command to measure the temple in Revelation 11, 1-2, to proclaim that it's proof that Revelation was written when the second temple in Jerusalem was standing. The verses say, And there was given me a reed like unto a rod, and the angel stood, saying, Rise, and measure the temple of God, and the altar, and them that worship therein. But the court which is without the temple leave out, and measure it not, for it is given unto the Gentiles, and the holy city they shall tread under foot forty and two months. First of all, ask yourself, why would a command be given for the saints to measure the physical Jewish temple? What's the point? The proper context is that the temple in Revelation 11, 1-2, is not a physical temple, but rather it's Messiah's Ecclesia of Saints, which is the temple in which the Heavenly Father dwells. The Greek word for temple is naos, which can be used to describe the spiritual temple. Acts 7, 48 says, Howbeit the Most High dwelleth not in temples made with hands, as saith the prophet. Acts 17, 24 says, God that made the world and all things therein, seeing that he is Lord of heaven and earth, dwelleth not in temples made with hands. Ephesians 2, 19-22 says, Now, therefore, you are no longer strangers and foreigners, but fellow citizens with the saints and members of the household of God, having been built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets, 
Jesus Christ himself being the chief cornerstone, in whom the whole building, being joined together, grows into a holy temple in the Lord, in whom you also are being built together for a dwelling place of God in the Spirit. 1 Peter 2, 4-7 says, Ye also, as lively stones, are built up a spiritual house, a holy priesthood, to offer up spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God by Jesus Christ. Wherefore also it is contained in the scripture, Behold, I lay in Zion a chief cornerstone, elect, precious, and he that believeth on him shall not be confounded. Unto you, therefore, which believe, he is precious. But unto them which be disobedient, the stone which the builders disallowed, the same is made the head of the corner. So the spiritual house is the holy temple in which the Father dwells. Revelation 3.12 says, Him that overcometh will I make a pillar in the temple of my God. The pillar points to a leader in Messiah's ecclesia, not a building pillar. The command in Revelation 11, 1-2, tells us to use the rule of Scripture to measure a church to see if it teaches a scriptural gospel. This was primarily fulfilled by Catholic monk Martin Luther, who, given the Scriptures, found out that the Roman Catholic Church is an apostate church and not part of the true temple of Messiah, but is delegated to the outer court of the Gentiles. It's proclaiming that the outer court of the temple is given to Gentiles, which has no application to the Gentile Romans in the first century. Rather, it's pointing to false churches, namely the Roman Catholic Church, which pretends to be a part of Messiah's temple, but since they teach a false gospel, they are Gentiles and not part of the true temple of God. Revelation 11.2 says that the Gentiles tread down the holy city for 42 months. But the Romans didn't tread Jerusalem underfoot for three and a half years, as they were camped outside the city until 70 AD. They only trampled the city at the end of the Jewish-Roman War of 66 to 70 AD. The Roman Antichrist beast popes trampled down Holy Jerusalem, which is the name of the city of Messiah's saints. During their 1260 year civil reign of power from 538 to 1798 AD, the Antichrist beast popes tortured and killed many millions of saints during the Dark Ages and Inquisition, so the holy city was tread underfoot. And I cover this in detail in the Measuring of the Temple of Revelation 11 video. The Temple of Revelation 11 one is not physical, so it's not proof of an early writing of Revelation. Preterists say that Revelation 11.8 proves that the great city is Jerusalem as Messiah was crucified there. It says, And their dead bodies shall lie in the street of the great city, which spiritually is called Sodom in Egypt, where also our Lord was crucified. First, Jerusalem is not referred to as the great city, but rather as the holy city. The great city of the first century was Rome, which controlled Judea in the first century. Secondly, the word was in Revelation 11.8 indicates a past tense, as the translators use that word as Messiah was crucified outside Jerusalem. But there is no Greek word in the manuscripts for the word was. So the underlying Greek text reads, where also our Lord crucified. Given the proper context of Revelation 11.1-2, which is measuring the Roman Catholic Church, you can walk into any parish and basilica and see our Lord crucified on their wicked crucifix. So the point I'm making is the passage could read, where also our Lord is crucified, active tense. During their blasphemous Eucharist ceremony, they proclaimed to sacrifice Messiah again for sins, which denies his one-time blood sacrifice. The Roman priests fulfill Hebrews 6.6, 6, which says, if they shall fall away, to renew them again under repentance, seeing they crucify to themselves the Son of God afresh, and put him to open shame. And they carry out this wicked tradition in front of the graven image crucifix, which keeps Messiah perpetually crucified on the cross, openly mocking him and his sacrifice per Galatians 3.13. Christ hath redeemed us from the curse of the law, but being made a curse for us, for it is written, Cursed is everyone that hangeth on a tree. Graven images are forbidden in the Ten Commandments, so the wicked popes remove the Second Commandment from their list, 
and they cause Catholics to make and revere the wicked crucifix, which fill Catholic parishes and homes around the world. To take the narrative of the crucifix on which Messiah is crucified further, the underlying Greek for the number 666 in Revelation 13.18 is Chai Zai Stigma. Chai represents Christ. Zai represents a beam, the cross. Stigma represents the nails that affix Messiah to the cross. It's pointing directly at the crucifix, graven image of the Antichrist beast popes, which mocks Messiah by keeping him on the cross. So we can see that Revelation 11.8 can point to the Roman Catholic Church, featuring Messiah crucified in all of their churches. We can see that it's not a proof that Jerusalem is the great city that is being referred to in this prophecy. Preterists say that the harlot of Revelation 17 points to the Jews in Jerusalem, and the precedent of the house of Israel and the house of Judah being called the harlot gives us a type. It points to a people group who proclaims to serve God, but are steeped in the worship of pagan gods. In the Gospels and Epistles of the New Testament, we don't see any mention of the Jews of the first century worshiping pagan gods, so it doesn't apply to them. Revelation 17.1 says, And there came one of the seven angels, which had the seven vials, and talked with me, saying unto me, Come hither, I will show unto thee the judgment of the great whore that sitteth upon many waters. The seven vials are about the judgment of the harlot church of Rome, which sits upon many waters, meaning it influences many different people groups. There are 223,000 parishes in many countries worldwide with 1.3 billion members. Political and business leaders traveled to Rome to meet with the Pope, so we can see their influence. Revelation 17, 2-3 says, With whom the kings of the earth have committed fornication, and the inhabitants of the earth have been made drunk with the wine of her fornication. So he carried me away in the spirit into the wilderness, and I saw a woman sit upon a scarlet-covered beast, full of names of blasphemy, having seven heads and ten horns. John is describing the Roman beast kingdom, which had seven forms of government, seven heads, and then split into ten civil kingdoms, the ten horns. The Roman Catholic Church proclaims to be the one true church of Messiah, but its main basilica has an Egyptian obelisk of the sun god Ra in the middle of a sun wheel, and its temple is filled with sun symbol graven images. So here's St. Peter's Square, and here, right in front of their main temple, is an Egyptian obelisk, which was placed there by the Pope. The Popes of Rome erected ten obelisks around Rome, so we see that though it proclaims to be Messiah's one true church, but symbolically the harlot is worshipping pagan gods. I explain the fulfillment of Revelation 17 in great detail in the two Revelation 17 Mystery Babylon the Great videos. Still, the fulfillment seems so obvious that it's hard to comprehend that people can't see it. Revelation 17.4 says, And the woman was arrayed in purple and scarlet color, and decked with gold and precious stones and pearls, having a golden cup in her hand full of abominations and filthiness of her fornication. Preterists point to verses that proclaim that the Israelites were commanded to wear purple and scarlet, but they leave out the command to also wear blue. Numbers 15, 37 to 40 focuses on the color blue and the meaning behind it. And the Lord spake unto Moses, saying, Speak unto the children of Israel, and bid them that they make them fringes in the borders of their garments throughout their generations, and that they put upon the fringes of the borders a ribbon of blue. And it shall be unto you for a fringe, that ye may look upon it and remember all the commandments of the Lord, and do them and that ye seek not after your own heart and your own eyes, after which ye use to go a-whoring, that ye may remember and do all my commandments, and be holy unto your God. The color blue tells the children of Israel to remember the Father's commandments, and do them as to not be a whore of worshiping other gods. The woman in Revelation 17 is not wearing blue, nor keeping the Father's commandments. Rather, she is causing Catholics to break the Ten Commandments, and we see her whoring after false gods in the Egyptian obelisk, in the sun wheel in St. Peter's Square. And in the Son of Perdition video in the Revelation Timeline Decoded video series, I show 
how the popes caused Catholics to break the Ten Commandments. Thus their name is the man of sin, the son of perdition. The harlot Roman Catholic Church also erected an Egyptian obelisk in front of the Roman Pantheon temple to all pagan gods, which they renamed the Basilica of Santa Maria and Martyrs. The Roman Catholic Cardinal and Archbishop's official colors are purple and scarlet, so we see a direct match. The Pope's tiara is decked with gold and precious stones and pearls, and this is the direct opposite of Messiah who wore a crown of thorns. Her priests used the golden cup during their blasphemous Eucharist ceremony, which proclaims the sacrifice Messiah again for sins, which denies his one-time atonement. Here's a coin from Pope Leo that features a woman with a cross, so a supposed Christian church, who also has a golden cup in her other hand, fulfilling the description in Revelation 17. There's much more to the explanation of those prophecies, but that summary should help you see the truth of historicism and the deception of preterism. The three Revelation Timeline Fulfillment Overview videos will help you see the big picture of the fulfillment of most of the prophecies in Revelation during the last 1900 years, which invalidates the preterist narrative. The 66 video Revelation Timeline Decoded series gives a detailed explanation. And there are PDF summaries on the Revelation Timeline Decoded website, which you can save and print, which help you see the big picture. And that address is www.revelationtimelinedecoded.com. If this lesson helped you, please click on the YouTube thumbs up, post a comment, and share it with others. And be sure to subscribe to the channel so that you're notified about new videos. Keep pressing on for the glory of our King. I love y'all. Shalom.